Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar, Water Level Monitoring for Title Analysis. My name is Paul Gannett, and I am Product Marketing Manager for Environmental Monitoring Products here at Onset. Before I turn the presentation over to our presenter, Bert Wynas of Rogers Surveying, I'd like to give you a brief introduction. Oops. Um, sorry about that. First, a brief overview of Onset. For those of you who don't know us, we are the company that makes the industry-leading hobo data loggers. We've been making data loggers since 1981, right here in Massachusetts on beautiful Cape Cod, where we design and build all of our products. Our logging solutions are used all over the world for monitoring environmental conditions and building performance, and we have a global network of dealers to service our customers around the world. This webinar will last approximately one hour, 50 minutes for the presentation and 10 minutes for your questions. Should you have questions, please type them into the questions section on your go-to control panel. If we don't get to every question in the allotted time, we will follow up with you after the presentation. We are recording the webinar today and you will receive a follow-up email within a few days with a link to the recording so that you can review it at your convenience and share it with colleagues. We are always looking to improve the onset education program, so please take a few minutes to give us your feedback. An evaluation survey will pop up on your screen after the webinar closes. At this point, I would like to welcome Bert Wynas, our presenter for today. Bert is a project manager at Rogers Surveying, Staten Island, New York, overseeing various land and hydrographic survey projects, including multiple title studies for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, wetland mitigation projects, and navigation channel bathymetric surveys. Prior to this, Bert was in the oil and gas industry performing geophysical and hydrographic survey services in the U.S. and overseas. So, without any further ado, here is Bert. To join us and sharing with you a title study project performed for the Army Corps of Engineers in the New York area recently. Um, this webinar hopes to show a cost-effective method of determining relatively accurate tight datums utilizing compact pressure sensors um, in conjunction with sound survey practices. Now, First of all, I'd just like to talk about the, the motivation for the, the title studies in, in general. Um, following the destruction of Hurricane Katrina, a study by the Emergency Performance Evaluation Task Force, known as IPET, which was made up of over 50 government organizations, universities, and private industry, um, amongst other findings and learned lessons, identified the need for U.S. Army Corps of Engineers project controlling elevations and datums be properly and accurately referenced to the National Spatial Reference System, NSRS, as used by all core districts, federal, state, and local agencies with responsibility for flood modeling, flood control projects, bathymetric and topographic mapping, and flood insurance rate mapping. Now, out of this um, IPET um, evaluation, um, the Department of the Army, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, produced a guiding document entitled Engineering and Design Comprehensive Evaluation of Project Datums, known as CEPD. And it provides detailed procedures and methodologies for determining site-specific project vertical control and title datum evaluation. So it's, it's under the CEPD guidance that Roger Surveying, under contract to the Army Corps of Engineers New York District, undertook and performed the title analysis study that is the subject of this webinar today. Now this very intensive and extensive IPAD evaluation, which was led by the Army Corps of Engineers, found a number of failings in the New Orleans flood protection systems. The study, which contains thousands of documents generated by engineers, architects, universities, and various government agencies, reported on all that was regarded as contributing to the system failure. 
from lack of system coordination and redundancy measures to the provision of contingency plans in the event of individual structure or facility failure. The findings that led to the generation of the CEPD and those that pertain to the subject of this webinar was the fact that vertical elevation datums were either not consistent or current throughout the projects or they were being misinterpreted. These slides here taken from the IPET report and the Army Corps of Engineers CEPD recommendations highlight the need for the relationship between tidal datums and land-based geodetic datums. And to show an example of the resultant effect when tidal datums are misinterpreted, as is the case here where a benchmark was assumed to be either local mean sea level or, or NGVD, there was a, a misunderstanding as to which mean sea level was being used. This one foot difference here at the benchmark translates to a, a structure that is built one foot either lower or higher depending on the case. If it's lower, obviously it's a, it has a greater impact. Now the assumption that local mean sea level and NGVD 29 mean sea level are the same elevation at a local benchmark can result in the constructed elevation of a flood wall being one foot lower than designed. This solid relationship between geodetic or orthometric datums and hydraulic or tidal datums is apparently of critical concern and especially in flood control systems where interdependency of one structure and other structures possibly some distance away is essential. And when we have water bodies where one is possibly a lake or a reservoir with its specific datum in close proximity to say a tidal river or estuary with a different determinant for elevation, it can be seen that confusion to say the least will exist. So how do we ensure that these water-based vertical datums are adequately related to land-based datums? The CB CEPD require that all the relevant projects be referenced to the National Spatial Reference System, NSRS. Now NOAA's National Geodetic Survey, NGS, defines and maintains the NSRS. The NSRS includes a network of permanently marked points, a consistent, accurate, and up-to-date national shoreline, a network of continuously operating reference stations, known as CORES, which support three-dimensional position, positioning activities and a set of accurate models describing dynamic geophysical processes that affect spatial measurements. For over 200 years, NGS and its predecessor agencies have collaborated with surveyors in both the public and private sectors to build hundreds of thousands of survey marks throughout the United States, determining positional information for each mark. Each survey mark is published with accurate horizontal and or vertical information such as latitude, longitude, and or height. Typically a mark may be a brass or bronze or aluminum disc, but it might also be deeply driven rod or, or a prominent object like a, a water tower or church spire. Increasingly the continuously operating global positioning system, receivers of core stations, are used as reference stations as well. This collection of points, over one and a half million of them, form a network that is used to accurately position other points of interest. Surveyors and others use the NSRS throughout the country to ensure that their positional coordinates are compatible with those determined by others. And this way, when they create mar maps, mark off property boundaries and plan, design and build roads, bridges and other structures, everything matches up. Now websites associ associated with the National Spatial Reference System contain invaluable tools with reference material including software and various coordinate transformation kits, survey control search tools, historic and predicted tide data, GPS data, and numerous other educational and practical services. 
with access to these tools and services, survey projects either on the water or land benefit from the knowledge that reliable and maintained data of various types can be utilized to provide solid reference to a common positional system. And here we have um, access to these sites, um, NOAA's site, uh, Ocean Service, uh, there are wonderful sites for, for getting this information. Now the National Water Level Program, NWLP, and the National Water Level Observation Network, NWLON, operated by NOAA and National Ocean Service, NOS, consists of a network of long and short term water level monitoring stations, serving as a national water level datum reference also connected to NSRS. And it provides yet another invaluable tool and resource for any person wishing to conduct wa work on or near the water. With tide and weather stations throughout the country providing real time and historical water level and meteorological data. With access to predicted tide information, planning of survey and engineering projects can be more efficient and productive. With access to downloadable historic tide information, hydrographic survey information can be checked and referenced to reliable water and or land-based vertical datums. And in the case of, of this study, historic tide data from NOAA's tide stations were used as the basis for connection to the most current tidal epoch. And here we have just a couple of examples of um, predicted tide here where you can go and if you're working a particular site you can put in the date um, and it will give you um, the predicted tide for that, that area. And over here on the left we have historical data. When I say historical it may be a day old um, or a few hours old. Um, and that then gives you the comparison between the predicted data in the blue and the, the red, which is the actual measured tide data at the site. Now, in order to get, um, this data also get, gets corrected. Um, perhaps two weeks later, a new set of data, historical data will appear for this site, which is slightly more accurate if, if there are any issues with jumps in the data that they are removed. At this stage, I would, I would like to provide some basic datum and tide reference information. When discussing tide datums and geodetic matters, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the Army Corps of Engineers are the authority. Their websites, in conjunction with the National Geodetic Survey, NGS, and the National Ocean Service, NOS, provide invaluable educational information, reference material, and free downloadable tide data horizontal and vertical control and numerous other services. The following slides give a, a general overview on, on datum determinations along with some of the terminology used in this webinar. The metonic cycle of close to 19 years comes from the ancient Greek astronomer Meton and is very close to the common multiple of the lunar and solar months and being that the sun and the moon have the greatest influence on Earth's tide cycle approximately 19 years, actually 18.6, contains all the significant tidal periods necessary to generate the reference tidal epoch. And here we just see um, some of the terms that will be used in the webinar, uh, whether it's mean high, high water, mean high water, mean sea level. Now, in this area of the, the northeast of the states, um, what we have is a semi diurnal tide where we have two highs and, and two lows in, in a 24 hour period. The two highs are one is higher than the other and the two lows one is lower than the other. That is why we have a mean high high water and a mean high water. And the same as uh, mean low water and mean low low water. The following is a, is a very brief description of two of the vertical datums relating to the CEBD project. 
NGVD 29, which is, a, is an older datum, and NEVD 88, which is a, is a current land-based datum, um, they're taken, and this is taken from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration uh, websites. Now, NGVD 29 refers to a vertical control datum established in 1929, which at the time was named sea level datum of 1929. It was the result of an adjustment of 106,724 kilometers of leveling, which held fixed mean sea level at 26 tide gauges in the USA and Canada. Subsequent observations realized that holding fixed mean sea level values at the various tide gauges and, geolog and plus the effects of geological activities over time produced errors in the realm of 9 meters. NAVD88 came into being as a consequence of approximately 625,000 additional kilometers of leveling and the readjustment of the combined addition additional leveling and remaining undisturbed NGVD-29 benchmarks using a minimum constraint adjustment of the Canadian-Mexican-US observations. This time it was referenced to local mean sea level value at Father Point, Ramowski, Quebec, Canada. Now the fact that the 26 um, tide gauges were, were held fixed, that was the, the problem. It was assumed that the elevations at these um, gauges were, 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 were equal. Um, and so the, the leveling data was adjusted um, with that in mind. And as we have found out over the years, that is not the case. Mean sea level in one area can be quite different from mean sea level at another area. Now, when these surveyors of old performed their thousands of miles of traditional differential level runs, they did so in a very similar way to present-day surveyors performing differential leveling. The process requires the transfer of elevation of a known point to that of an un unknown point, and eventually to other points of known elevation or back to the original known point. As we see here, if we, if we start at a a benchmark with a known elevation and we go to unknown points and then back to the known, known point again we can determine the elevations of these points and the closure we then have a closure at this point that we can adjust that adjustment is then spread throughout the others in, in various there are various methods of doing this but um, that's the basic uh, concept of, of differential leveling for those of you who, who are not familiar with it now, it relies on the utilization of a, a leveling instrument set up on a tripod that, when adjusted appro appropriately, sights in a perp perfectly perpendicular plane to that of the direction of the force of gravity at that particular location. So what we're saying is, at this point, this line here is perpendicular to the line that uh, the gravitational line. You can see here that the method is just the same. We, we use a tri tripod with a differenti differential level, and we have gentlemen out there with, with um, level rods that, that we use to transfer the, the elevations. Now, due to the, the variations in the strength and direction of, of the gravity vectors, this perpendicular plane corresponding, correspondingly will reflect the gravity undulations. So differential leveling is a very reliable method of transferring elevations. With the introduction of GPS technology, we are provided with an additional tool to not only acquire accurate horizontal positional information, but also, while perhaps to a slightly lesser degree of accuracy, acquire vertical elevation data as well. GPS navigation and surveying is made possible through the application of geodetic principles in the form of mathematically defined GPS orbits and Earth representative ellipsoids. In addition, geoid modeling is required in order to reduce the GPS ellipsoidal elevation to useful on the ground orthometric heights. 
While the various ellipsoids are mathematical shapes selected to best represent the geoid at a general location, example, the, the, the continental United States, the geoid is a complex model derived from gravity readings, spherical harmonics, and generally intensive computations, which go over my head at the moment. Gravity data is acquired through terrestrial measurement by means of absolute gravimeters, the modern version of which uses retro reflectors and lasers, and through precise satellite-to-satellite -satellite measurements where the influence of Earth's gravity is reflected in the measured satellite-to-satellite -satellite distances, thus allowing refinement of the geoid. And this has constantly been uh, redefined. The current geoid for the U.S. is the geoid 12A. At the time of the majority of the CEPD projects, Roger Surveying used the then most current geoid model, which was geoid 09. And if we could see the geoid, it might look something like this. So we can see that while GPS provides us with, with the height above the ellipsoid, the geoidal separation, as we here n, and contained within the geoid model allows for the orthometric height h to be derived. This can be achieved in the field when the geoid model is contained in the receiver, the GPS receiver or login device, or alternatively, if performing static GPS as is the requirement in CEPD if deriving elevations using GPS, then the process of deriving the orthometric height is performed during post-processing of the data. So this being the, the ellipsoid and the GPS heights will be relative to the ellipsoid, the geoidal model contains this information here. And it's a, a grid-based type of model that is, is stored, like I said, in the, in the GPS receivers. Or when you get back to the office, if you're doing a static GPS work, then that model is applied in the um, processing of, of that data. So on to the particular CPD project here that uh, I would like to talk about, the uh, East River in, in New York. From, from the information contained in the CPD and the scope of work provided by the Army Corps of Engineers New York District, Roger Surveying were tasked with the determination of mean lower low water. Its reference to the geodetic vertical datum NAVD88 and connection to the National Spatial Reference System, NSRS, through reference of a primary project control benchmark for each specific uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers navigation project area. This here being this here being one particular project area. There are many projects, um, and this is one. In addition, vertical benchmarks were to be established at each of the tide gauge locations throughout the various navigation projects. The Army Corps of Engineers manage a number of navigable waterways with channel depths ranging from 6 feet to 40 and 50 feet. Historically, each navigation project was referenced to mean low water with respect to mean sea level. Following the CEPD, the requirements are that these tidal navigation projects now be referenced to mean lower low water with a datum difference relative to the geodetic datum of NAVD88. This way we have a, a direct connection between the water-based datum and the, and the land-based NAVD88. A geodetic survey and differential leveling techniques incorporating traditional total station traversing and our GPS methods were to be utilized for the addition or reestablishment of additional benchmarks with, within the project site. Following the guidance provided in the CBD documentation and NOAA's requirements for short-term tide gauges needed to update tide models at a navigation project, contained within that document, 
a 30-day tidal monitoring period was decided upon, with water level data being logged at, at six-minute intervals throughout. Tidal data from the Center for Oper Operational Oceanographic Products and Services, co-ops, nearby tide station would then be downloaded for concurrent time period to be used in the analysis stage. While Roger Surveying have conducted 10 of these projects, we will discuss general procedures with data examples from, from the East River job. As shown here on, on the right is a number of CBD projects already performed for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. This being the East River, down here we have the, the Shrewsbury River, um, Sandy Hook Bay and a, and a number of sites around here. Over here we have um, Fire Island, Long Island Intercoastal, um, Shinnecock in, in, Inlet and Mariches Inlet. And this drawing here um, shows a typical U.S. Army Corps of Engineers hydrographic survey of, of one of their navigation projects. And the, and the obvious importance of ensuring the channels are adequately dredged to the correct depth and the appropriate datum. With the widespread use of GPS, a seamless and standard reference system can be incorporated through reliance on the NSRS, where a dredge operation utilizing real-time kinematic RTK GPS or real-time network, which is RTN GPS, will be connected or can be connected to the same reference system used by the surveyor who established the vertical elevation control for that particular site. And that also is of, of critical importance that the people doing the digging of the channels are in sync with those people who, who did the initial survey of, of the monuments. And that is that is achieved through through connection with the NSRS. Now based on the, the project description and requirements, project management at Rogers Surveying decided to utilize small pressure sensors as a primary method of water level monitoring and data collection. On review of market availability, the sensor choice was the U20 water level logger manufactured by Onset. This sensor provided the ideal tool facilitating customized installation, ease of deployment, and accessibility for data download and configuration. And this is just a, a little diagram of the sensor itself um, with the housing. Um, this cap can be taken off, removed for download of data, um, and the actual sensor is here. And we have the accurate dimensions showing where the face of the sensor is so that during deployment um, we can very accurately position this to a known vertical point. Shown here are various methods of deployment utilized for the tidal study projects. For the projects discussed here, the method with the sensor attached to a, a plastic coated steel cable was the most effective. With the cable attached to the sensor and the other end to a small eye bolt on the PVC screw cap, the sensor was lowered into a two inch PVC pipe which had already been fastened to a bulkhead or pile, as was the case in the majority of the installations on the East River. Also seen are alternative methods used for seafloor deployment when no available structure was av accessible. The sand screw method consisted of a small section of two inch PVC pipe, which we can see here, attached near the top of the sand screw with the sensor inside it. So this, this PVC was attached up here, was clamped on. Um, divers then screwed the assembly into the seafloor at the required water level monitoring location. Where seafloor conditions didn't allow for insertion of the sand screw, the concrete blocks shown in the frame were used. 
with these a small again a small section of PVC was attached to a, a section of rebar here a rope was attached to this eye bolt um, and this assembly here was was lowered to the seabed with the assistance of a customized uh, A-frame and ropes. Also seen here is the, the Hobo shuttle which can be used independently of a laptop computer when, when launching or starting the um, and stopping the, the U2 sensor. It's simply a case of disconnecting this cap, unscrewing this, placing the sensor in here and it, it reads it automatically. Now the, the following methodology was used in the performance of the East River CPD project. And uh, without apology, I say that Google Earth was used as an initial planning and reconnaissance tool with general tide gauge locations selected based upon their physical installation, suitability, and their proximity to the predetermined locations. So for this project, we were to install 12 water level pressure sensors set up to log at six minute intervals. Um, the establishment of a primary project control benchmark. And in this case, we used a, an NGS disk um, we're put to perform static GPS to connect this PPCBM to NSRS. Um, and we were to provide horizontal positional determined by RTK GPS. Um, if NGS elevations are used, we needed a check to three other NGS title benchmarks. And they were to be set and referenced tide, tide gauge benchmarks to the BPCM. With the tight sensor locations tentatively selected, a field reconnaissance was conducted to establish the exact locations for the tight sensors, along with establishing any access issues or required permissions. For the most part, public access locations were chosen. Prior to deployment, all pressure sensors were checked at a local marina to ensure consistency amongst readings. For this, an arbitrary elevated tide board was set and visual readings taken periodically at specific six-minute intervals in unison with the sensor program recording interval. That is basically what we see down here. We have all the, the sensors inserted in the PVC pipes and we have a, a tide board here. And at six-minute intervals, the, the, the tide was read, recorded at precisely the same time that these sensors were, were set up to, to record their data. And here we can see a, a, a typical um, installation with uh, the sensor installed here. And we have a tide board with a, with a reference mark, a PK nail in the pile, which later on we'll see that that is, that is elevated to the benchmarks in the surrounding area. Down here we have um, Noah's Tide Station at the battery, which is located down here. For locations on the East River, the 2-inch PVC stilling pipes were incorporated for all locations with wooden piles or bulkheads facilitating the installation of both the PVC pipe and the wood staff accompanying each sensor for the purpose of calibration. Ladders were used to gain access from the land at some locations. Like I said, most of them were installed on, on piles or, or bulkheads. This particular one um, there was nothing in, in the vicinity, and it's by Hellgate in, on the East River. The only, this was the only, only structure. It was all steel. So in that case, we had to um, clamp a big board on here to this H-beam and then um, install the tide board and the tide gauge um, pipe on here. Here we just see the, after the, si uh, the sensors installed in here, and the cap is, is screwed on. And this being a, a typical installation also with a tide board, which we set them arbitrarily. 
at um, six or seven feet. Um, and then later on, we elevated these points and uh, recalibrated calibrated the sensors. Now, where tight sensors could not be installed at a convenient structure, access by water was provided by means of Rogers surveying survey vessels, two of which we see here. In the case of the seafloor mounted sensors, none of which were, were installed on the East River, either the concrete block method was employed or the sand screw installation um, was used by our resident company owner and diver, Dan Rogers. We can see him bobbing his head around about here. This particular photo shows Dan following a very uh, arduous swim whereby he used an airbag to lift one of the concrete blocks, which you saw earlier, to its designated location. This particular location um, was relatively close to a rock jetty and it, and it was decided not to use um, our survey vessel, which would have been this one, uh, for that deployment, being that it was so close to the rocks. So in this case, um, Captain Dan here swam with a, with a block um, suspended on, on this uh, airlift and uh, this was him at the end of it. This was the vessel that we used on, on the East River to get, to get access to the sensors. Now after the, the pressure sensors uh, were started, we used a, a laptop computer to, to start them in conjunction with the, the, the Hobo shuttle here. Um, so this connects to the laptop and then the sensor is inserted in here and the, and the unit is, is configured and, and started. Um, the laptop, we were running a HoboWare Pro software and the Hobo uh, waterproof shuttle as we see here. The first calibration readings are recorded after approximately 20 minutes. And this allows the sensor to acclimatize to, to the water. Calibration is performed by taking visual water level readings at a tight staff located adjacent to the sensor installation at a precise six minute logging event. This process is repeated a number of times during the 30 day logging period. In addition to the water level sensors, a number of U-20 sensors are deployed throughout the project to record barometric pressure. And the reason for that is the sensor that is inserted into this pipe is recording not only the pressure exerted by the water, but the pressure exerted by the air, um, atmospheric pressure. So once the, on completion of the project, once the, the data is downloaded, the, um, the data from the barometric uh, sensors are also downloaded and it's basically a simple case of one set of readings being taken away from the other set of readings allowing for um, only the water pressure to be represented by that gauge. The tight stuff is, is either referenced to a, a benchmark at a known NAVD88 elevation or to an arbitrary elevation to be later referenced to 88, utilizing either differential leveling, um, RTK GPS, and, and, and static GPS. And here we see the, um, the, the barometric pressure is inserted into a small PVC pipe here. Now, calibration of the, the seafloor mounted sensors was a little more involved. It was carried out in one of two ways. Using our survey vessel here, fitted with dual RTK GPS receivers, if in water depths greater than 10 feet. That was basically the, uh, if it was greater than 10 feet, we would use this method. Or where water depths were shallow enough, we used an additional pressure sensor fitted inside a 10-foot section of PVC and mounted to a sand screw. That sand screw was then um, inserted into the seafloor sea with the um, PVC pipe above the water. That PVC pipe was then elevated using differential leveling. Now, in the case of calibration using the survey vessel, 
The calibration process was performed in two stages, the first being the calibration of the GPS antenna heights above the water surface, and then the actual calibration of the C4 sensor itself using the correlation of the recorded GP, GPS heights with the pressure sensor data. So first of all, what we had to do was we had to determine the elevations of these um, RTK GPS receivers above the water. Now, if you're to go out there and measure them physically, the simple fact that you're standing here measuring with uh, a tape measure, you're, you're affecting that measurement, plus you're bobbing around. So what we have here is we have an RTK base station set up at a known elevation point. We have a radio antenna up here that is transmitting the, the corrections. We then have a, a radio receiving antenna here that receives those corrections and applies them in real time to the, uh, to the data collectors on board here. Now the calibration of the RTK GPS antenna heights above the water surface was performed by recording RTK, RTK GPS data at one second intervals for three minutes spanning the interval during which the sensor was programmed to record. Now, if the, if the sensor was, was programmed to record at six minutes past the hour, which it was, it was recorded, it was programmed to record on the hour, six minutes, 12 minutes, then we would, we would log data for a period that coincided with that six minute interval. And we would do that three times. And there would be an averaging process. There would be averaging of the, the two um, receivers data and there would also be an averaging of the three sets of, of data. During the actual calibration of the seafloor sensors using the survey vessel, the vessel basically idled in the vicinity of the seafloor sensor. An RTK GPS data was recorded at one second intervals for three three minute sessions at the same six minute interval that the sensor was programmed to record data. This data would then be used after retrieval of the sensors to calibrate the data accordingly. What we see here is the, um, this is actually just from a spreadsheet showing the, uh, the two GPS receivers and this will, will represent one of the, the three sessions where we have, this was the GPS and antenna height that was, um, that was the GPS height when we recorded the data after calibration, this was the um, number here, the same in this case, and we get an adjusted elevation of 138 here and 135. Those are then averaged. And we come up with the um, elevation of the water being 1.37 at this specific time. And then this would correlate to the, to the sensor um, data when we retrieved it. As previously discussed in earlier slides, a, re a requirement to connect the water level datum to the orthometric datum and to the NSRS system. This was performed by employing a combination of static GPS, RTK GPS, and differ differential leveling. In this particular instance of the East River job, the primary project control benchmark, the PPCBM, which we can see over here, was an NGS disk approximately midway through the length of the project. With a particular benchmark being a vertical control point, it did not have an accurate horizontal component. To provide a horizontal position for this, the static GPS observations were submitted to NGS Opus. The actual posted NGS elevation was used and was checked by means of differential leveling to a number of other NGS disks in the vicinity. And what we see here is basically some lines representative of, of vectors, and the yellow ones being the OPUS connections. When OPUS supplied the, um, the position it used, um, base stations in this direction. 
um, the red are r representative of four hour static GPS which we use to tie this benchmark, uh, the primary control benchmark to other benchmarks for the other tie gauges. Some of them were uh, for four hours, some of them for 30 minutes. And here the brown lines uh, represent the differential leveling that was performed throughout these benchmarks here. The remaining tight sensor locations were re referenced to the PPCBM using static GPS observations, which were processed using Trimble business software. All GPS RINIC files were also submitted to Opus for a, an independent check. RTK GPS was used to provide horizontal locations on points not otherwise located using static GPS, and where GPS was unsuitable due to location of benchmark, then a total station was used for, for a horizontal location. All benchmarks either newly installed by Roger Surveying for the project or existing NGS disks were referenced to each other and the tight sensor location by means of differential leveling. With this, all BMs and tight sensor reference point are connected together and in turn connected to the PPC BM, which is further connected to the NSRS system. Also, it should be noted that a number of NGS control points were utilized in the various local networks and that by virtue of the fact that they are incorporated in the NGS system, they are already connected to the NSRS. And here we, we see in, um, in Google Map we have inserted KMZ files um, allowing us to, to click on these points, bringing up um, images of, of the benchmarks. In this case, this was a, an NGS disk here. Um, this here was the location of a, of a tie gauge and here we have the, the various benchmarks and the level run that was, was performed. Now after processing the, the static GPS data, um, the results and derived NAVD8 elevations were used to adjust the differential leveling data. This in turn provided an adjusted elevation for the tide sensor reference mark to be used for the calibration of the sensor data. So from the static GPS, just we'll take one as an example. From the static GPS information, we have derived a, an, eleva an NAVD elevation of 734 for this particular benchmark, GPSBM2. Now then, this is actually three. So for three, it would be 19.04. Then that 19.04 elevation would be used, and the differential level run here would be adjusted accordingly, and these elevations would then be derived. On completion of the 30-day monitoring period, retrieval of the sensors and download of, of all data, Hoboware software was used to combine water level sensor data and barometric sensor data, along with the calibration readings to correct tide data to NAVD88 vertical datum. Corrected time and water level data was then exported in tabulated format for input to Excel. And the process of calibration is, again, very, very simple. Here we see a plot of the, the data brought into Hobo software. It shows pressure readings, temperature, and the derived uh, water level uh, in feet. And when the data is brought in, you select the barometric um, data file, and you also select the reference water level that you want to use. So if at six minutes past 12 on Tuesday afternoon, particular date, you had a certain reading on your tide, uh, tide staff that is inserted in here, and this is the appropriate time selected. You generate a new uh, time series plot then, and that is your, your calibrated um, data. You have a number of these calibrations. So 
once you use one calibration, the data is, is, is viewed to see how the others agree. And for the most part, there was, there was very good agreement. The preferred and, and suggested method of title determination for this area of the U.S. is the um, National Ocean Service NOS Modified Range Ratio Method, um, a full description of which can be found at this link here. But on the next slide, I, I, will, I will also uh, talk about it. And it, its determination, it determines mean low water um, by using mean tide level uh, with a subtraction of half the mean range. And uh, mean high water is mean low water plus the mean range, and so on. So in order to compute the National Tidal Data MEPOC, NTDE, values at a short-term project tide gauge, this following process is, is followed. So the short-term gauges are the tertiary gauge, and the control gauge, in this case, was the NOAA's battery. Um, you determine the monthly mean at each of your tertiary gauges, you determine the monthly mean of, of your control gauge. So that was a, the 30 days worth of data. You determine the differences and ratios between the monthly mean of each datum and between the tertiary and control. Those differences and ratios are used as correctors to adjust um, the accepted 19-year datums at control station to derive your 19-year datum at your tertiary. And here also is the, the simple um, formulas for how that is done. Once in Excel, um, all the time series data for all the tight sensors was checked, and from it the various water level datums were extracted. The average of all the high water, low water, high high water, and low low water provided the mean of those datums for that sensor for the 30-day period. It was also necessary to download the simultaneous 30-day water level data for the, for the closest NOAA tide gauge, in this case the battery. The same mean water level datums were extracted from the battery data and further used in the modified range ratio method as, dis as I just described. And here is simply the, um, the data that's been averaged. So you've determined the uh, low water, the high water, the low low water. I don't see the high water there. Um, and from that, you can determine the, the mean range, the mean tide level, the DTL, diurnal tide level, um, the greater tide level, and the mean sea level. Those numbers are then used further in Excel. And here we can see this is a, is a plot of some of that data with the high highs and the, the high and the low lows and the, and the lows. And here is just a, a plot of, of a sample of, of that data also. This is the same, but this time for the, um, the battery. And a plot for the battery also. So what, what do we get? Once the, the five water level datums, that's the MN, the MTL, the DTL, GTR and MSL have been determined for the short-term gauge and the NOAA reference tide gauge. The formulas and the modified range ratio method are applied to provide NTDE corrected datums for these five water level datums. So what we see here is the 30 days of observed data for the, um, the battery for these datums. And we see the same for the uh, tertiary tag gauges. Over here, we have the accepted um, NTT 1983 to 2001 accepted um, datums. And then these are, are adjusted in, um, in Excel using, using formulas in Excel. And we, are, we then derive these numbers here. These five corrected datums at the short-term short -term gauges are then used to adjust for the additional water level datums required. 
with the mean lower low water being the reported datum requested for this for this project. And this is what we see here. Um, the battery here will be uh, the accepted um, datum levels above NAVD88 as supplied by NOAA. And here we have um, our computed datums as per um, our title study. Now, just as a as a check, VDatum is a is a free software tool being developed jointly by NOAA's National Geodetic Survey NGS and the Center for Operational Oceanographic Products and Services. VDatum is designed to vertically transform geospatial data among a variety of tidal, orthometric, and ellipsoidal vertical datums, allowing users to convert their data from different horizontal vertical references into a common system, and then enabling the fusion of diverse geospatial data and desired reference levels. VDatum was, was used to determine the various water level datums at the various tide sensor sites, and these were compared to the values computed from the Roger surveying tide study. And again, this, this software, you just go on, uh, you Google VDatum, and you can download this software. This is actually a new version I have here on my, my laptop. But um, you basically plug in your horizontal datum, your vertical, and what you want to convert it to, and you then get whether it be mean low water, mean low low water for that particular site. Very useful tool. And here are the basically the results of the comparison between V datum and, and our datum. Uh, sorry, our, our computed datums. And for the most part, they're they're very good. Um, with a little a little jump here. It's actually a big jump, but it's in a very dynamic part of the river, and there may be some kind of pooling going on there where the water is retained in, in that particular corner. Um, so, you know, as, as seen on the previous slide in the, in the table to the right here, the 2010 datum results for the mean lower water determination agrees with NOAA's V datum to within two tenths for all tide gauge locations except tide gauge 12 location at Talman Island. This particular gauge differs by 0.28. While the mobilization and demobilization calibration readings don't indicate an issue, it was noted that a warmer current of water existed in the vicinity due to a discharge from the Talman Island DP facility. It should also be noted that a difference of nearly one foot exists between the mean high high water determination at tide gauge seven located at Hell Gate, which is a very dynamic section of the river. While the Hobo U-20 pressure sensors perform well, there was one location, um, tide gauge three, where the sensor had been deliberately dislodged from the protective PVC pipe. Fortunately, with three calibration readings at this site, the time of the occurrence of this uh, dislodging of the sensor and the displacement amount was determined and the data was, was corrected for accordingly. So in, you know, in summary, I, I believe the results computed using the pressure sensor data and the relative close mirroring of NOAA's V datum determination provides a high level of confidence in, in this method. The period of 30 days was selected for this project, but shorter or longer term observations could certainly be, be, be accommodated with this method. Um, further analysis of, of the data could also be carried out and different methods used if so desired. So once again, I'd, <coughs> excuse me, I'd like to thank you all for, for joining myself, Roger Surveying and Anonset, um, allowing us to, to share with you uh, this project here. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Bert. Um, I guess we, we're running a little tight on time, but uh, uh, maybe we have time for a couple of questions, and then we can follow up on the other questions after uh, afterwards. Uh, so I'll give you a moment, uh, Bert, maybe to look through some of the questions. Do you, do you see them there? Um, yeah, there's. I see a number of, of questions here. Maybe you can pick out two that look – I haven't had a chance to – Uh, 
You know, just uh, as they stream in. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. difficult to, uh, to pause this. Yeah. While you're taking a look at those, um, let me address uh, one question. Uh, there was a question about the orientation of the water level logger. Does it have to be placed horizontally or vertically, or do, you know, does it matter? And yeah, the, the 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 water level logger can be placed in really any position. The key is that it's securely locked in place so that it doesn't move around. So that uh, as the water level changes above it. That it's uh, you know it's 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 seeing those accurately and it's not due to any shifting in the water level logger. So uh, I see I see also a, a question with regards to the six minute. I'll try and answer a couple here if we have time. The six minute interval was chosen because it's the the data recorded by NOAA is also recorded at six minute intervals. So it means you have a direct correlation at that moment, and you don't have to try and interpolate your readings. Um, also, our, the, the computer used to, to start the loggers were, were programmed, um, I'm sorry, they were calibrated to the NIST time stamp, so everything was very accurately uh, time synchronized. Let's say, let's pick one more and then we'll follow up with the rest of you. Yeah, there's a lot of good questions here. Uh, there's one, why do you put a cap on the PVC pipe? Wouldn't this cause air pressure inside, which would affect readings? Um, the, the, the whole tube is, is vented. Um, it's, got, it's got little vent holes um, below that cap and above the water, and it's got some um, in the water column as well. Um, it's partly due to the fact that it allows us a means of securing um, the sensor relatively easily. Um, the sensor is attached by the cable to the cap, and then um, we just go to the PVC pipe and insert it in there and screw it on. Um, for the most part, nobody tampered with it except that one, one particular location that I did mention. And it was a case that they tried to um, take the cap off, but what they ended up doing was taking the bolt off, and the whole sensor dropped down. Ouch. Okay. I think at this point we've, we're... Uh, we've reached our limit so uh, of uh, time, so we probably should wrap it up. So, like I said, we'll, we can follow up with the additional um, additional answers. And let's see, hopefully, there we go. Um, as I mentioned, we will be sending you a link to a recording of this presentation. Um, however, it, uh, we will be following up on some of the questions, and here's also our contact information. Here's uh, Bert's uh, contact information as well as Roger's surveying if you'd like to follow up with them. And if you have any questions for us here at Onset, here is our contact information. Uh, uh, please note that I've included our website address here, onsetcomp.com, where you can find detailed information on all of our data loggers. In the learning section, you can find an extensive library of webinars, white papers, application notes, and uh, many other resources. So you may want to refer to that. So at this point, I would like to wrap up this webinar by saying thank you to Bert for sharing his expertise with us today. And I'd also like to thank all of you for attending our webinar, and I hope that you found it well worth your while.